Hello, and welcome back for another Torah Tuesday. Last week, we picked up our study of Exodus in chapter 14, verses 1 through 9, and the pressure is on. This week, we're picking it up in verse 10, and we're going to do verses 10 through 14. I'll begin by reading from my translation from the Hebrew. When Pharaoh came near, the Israelites lifted up their eyes, and look, Egypt setting out after them. They were terrified. The Israelites cried out to Yahweh. They said to Moses, Was it because there were no graves in Egypt that you took us to die in the desert? What is this you have done to us, bringing us out of Egypt? Is this not what we said to you in Egypt? Leave us alone that we may serve Egypt? For it is better for us to serve Egypt than for us to die in the desert. Moses said to the people, Do not be afraid. Stand firm and see the salvation of Yahweh, which he will do for you today. For the Egyptians you see today, you will never see again. Yahweh will fight for you, but you yourselves remain quiet. All right, so plenty of things for us to talk about this week. The passage begins by saying, when Pharaoh came near. Now, the big question that might come to your mind, it comes to mind is, is Pharaoh himself actually part of his army? Is he going to war with the people? And it's true that in Egyptian iconography, Pharaoh is often depicted riding in a chariot straight into battle. And there is some evidence that Pharaoh did actually go to battle in a chariot um, with his troops. So it's possible that Pharaoh is with his people. It's also possible though, that that this statement when Pharaoh came near is using Pharaoh as metonymy for the entire army. That is to say, it's a figure of speech that, that refers to everyone collectively. Pharaoh is the one who had sent them away. Now Pharaoh is coming after them with the help of his army or via his army. So Pharaoh is possibly there, not necessarily. The army is doing his bidding. Um, This is a little bit related to what's later in the verse where it says Egypt setting out after them. Obviously, the the country isn't following them. Egypt is being used as metonymy for the people of Egypt or the, the army of Egypt that's setting out after them. The people cried out to Yahweh. This is a good thing. We should cry out to God when we're in distress. They follow this with a bad thing. They complain to Moses about their situation. They are very concerned about dying. um, And obviously the fear of death is reasonable. They're being chased by a vicious army who wants to destroy them or re-enslave them. And so it's, it's understandable that they're afraid. But they say... It is better for us to serve Egypt than for us to die in the desert. In Hebrew, the it is better is it's good for us. It's more good for us this than that. The people are trying to define for themselves what is good, what is good for them, rather than trusting that God knows what is good for them. In an ancient Egyptian context, to be buried, actually to be unburied, in no man's land is the worst possible fate. So it's understandable that they are afraid, Um, but they are failing to trust God in this situation. And God has proven himself over and over through the signs and wonders. So it's a missed opportunity to trust. Moses says to them, take your stand or stand firm. This is the same word that was used in chapter two, verse four, when Miriam took her stand by the Nile River to watch what would happen to Moses and to witness his deliverance. It's the same word to describe what Moses did when he took his stand by the Nile to to confront Pharaoh as he was coming. So that's in chapter 8, verse 20. That's verse 16 in Hebrew. Or also chapter 9, verse 13. In both places, Moses takes his stand. Now he's telling the people to take their stand. This word is often used in military contexts to uh, take your stand before the confrontation. And I'll give you a list of references here. Deuteronomy 7, 24, Deuteronomy 9, verse 2, and 11, verse 25, and Joshua 1, verse 5. In all those passages, the same verb is used to describe taking your stand before a military conflict. 
The verb is also used before a theophany or a manifestation of God's presence. So Exodus 19, 17, the people take their stand and watch God uh, reveal himself on the mountain. Numbers eleven sixteen and Deuteronomy 31, 14. So this is interestingly both. They're going to engage in a military conflict, but Yahweh's going to be the one fighting and it will be a manifestation of God's own presence. By paying attention to this word, take your stand, we're seeing part of the literary design of the book of Exodus because we first we begin the book with the rescue of Moses and Miriam's taking her stand and witnessing that and then now we're witnessing the rescue of the entire nation in a similar situation Moses was taken from the reeds of the Nile the people are now going to be brought through the sea of reeds and in both cases they've taken their stand here, Moses says to watch for the salvation of Yahweh. This is the first time we've seen the word salvation in the book of Exodus and, and the only time. In fact, this word salvation only occurs three times in the Torah, once in Genesis looking ahead, once in Deuteronomy looking back, but this does seem to be the decisive moment of salvation in the Torah. Now, Christians today often think of salvation in purely spiritual terms, like my soul is saved, but the Bible consistently just depicts salvation in embodied ways, in ways that, um, that impact people in the here and now. It involves rescue from physical danger, and that's definitely what we see here. It's interesting to remember that when the people left Egypt, they were organized for battle, or perhaps even armed for battle, and yet here Moses tells them not to fight. They're just going to watch as God does the fighting. He tells them, uh, to be quiet. Many translations, the NIV, NET, NRSV, and some others say to be still, but this doesn't seem to relate to movement, but rather sound. This word, harash, consistently refers to silence elsewhere. Um, they, and they were supposed to get moving, so they're not being still physically, they're being silent because they've already cried out to God and God has answered. He is in the process of answering, so they don't need to cry out anymore. They just need to get moving, uh, as we'll see in next week's video. God had heard their cry. He was taking action on their behalf. So this sets us up for the very exciting moment when they actually cross the sea. We'll return to that next week. Until then, keep reading the Torah and have a great week. Mm -hmm.